What's happening everybody? Welcome to Overkill Projects. Today we're gonna to pick up where we left off last time and use what we learned from application note 31 to put together a homemade seismograph. Here are the parts I'm gonna use and the parts that you could build them with. First up we have a magnet and it is magically secured to this about a 20 centimeter length of copper that I just straightened out from a coil of three millimeter outer diameter copper tubing that I had laying around from a previous project. And to put that together, I just grabbed the tubing, some isopropyl alcohol, some epoxy, in this case, JB Weld, uh, the magnets I'm gonna use, and some sandpaper, as well as something to mix the epoxy in. Then I just straighten out the tubing to the length I want, in this case, like I said, about 20 centimeters, and then just do what I could with a pair of wire cutters to cut through that. Uh, it didn't have to be too clean because in this case, there's not going to be anything in the tubing. Then I just sanded the end of the tubing in order to get a better surface for the epoxy to adhere to. Then I cleaned that up with a little bit of the uh, isopropyl alcohol to make sure that it's nice and clean. Then I did the exact same thing with one of the magnets that I'm going to use. In this case, the magnets come in tiny sections so I can attach more than one if I want to. Then I just poured out the amount of epoxy I needed according to the directions and then stir that up with the stick it comes with or whatever's laying around in the, uh, the plastic doodle that it comes in and now in this case I had already made a clamp uh, in order to hold this type of tubing so I'm just gonna use that to secure it while the epoxy dries but you could use any sort of clamp to clamp this thing down and then after waiting a few minutes for the epoxy to start to set up so that you don't have to sit there all day holding the magnet against the tubing you spread just a little bit on both the tubing and the magnet and then just hold them together for a minute or two until they're not gonna fall apart let gravity do the rest and then just wait for it to dry Besides the inverting amplifier that we put together last time, the only other thing that you're gonna need for this is going to be our coil of copper magnet wire. If you don't happen to have a coil laying around, and you probably don't, you can build one out of any sort of copper magnet wire that you might have laying around. This is a spool of sort of the good stuff. I think it's uh, maybe 36 AWG. And in case you don't know, copper magnet wire is just regular copper wire that's coated in a really thin layer of sort of like a, a varnish or epoxy. Uh, and that keeps it from conducting to the wires adjacent to it so that when you wrap it into a shape like a coil, the uh, current just travels all the way around the coil and not across all the different uh, layers of wire that you have wound up there. If you don't happen to have an entire spool of magnet wire just laying around your lab, you could always use some old chokes, or if you happen to have an old transformer sitting on a power supply that you don't use, something along those lines, then you can just disassemble these, take the wire off, and then wrap the wire around something to form a coil. In this case, the magnets that we're using are two millimeters in diameter, so we want a nice tight coil with an opening not much larger than that. In this case, we have an opening of somewhere in the order of three and a half millimeters, and I formed that by wrapping it around a candle, which I then stuck in the toaster oven and melted away. And in order to keep the coil together, I just covered it in epoxy. I also have it marked because I have a few of these different coils. And I just put that there to let me know how many winds this coil has. The last thing that I should have mentioned is that you're going to want something to secure your springy magnet thing too. In this case, I'm actually going to use this very disgusting looking clamp that I built for something else entirely but it will do a nice job. I have a little spot here where I can clamp down my magnet and I have a couple of spots in here where I can stick the coil. And that is why on this coil, you see that I epoxied two little nails onto either side. It's pretty much so that I can jam it into this or hammer it into a piece of wood or stick it into a piece of plastic, pretty much anything just to secure it down somehow. Unfortunately, part of the problem with building your own coil is you have to figure out how to stick it where you want it. It's not a very easy problem to solve, but I'll leave that one to you. All right, now let's go take a look at the circuit and the Arduino and see how this all comes together. Okay, now that we have all those pieces secured to this contraption here, now is a good time to go over just exactly how it is that this thing works. Now, in case you haven't guessed it, the reason I went with copper for the tubing, uh, why I went with such a small outer diameter for the tubing and why it is relatively long is that this is going to act as a spring and we're going to see that this system is going to act like a uh, damped oscillator. 
It should be easy enough to see that this is the case. I have the magnet floating sort of suspended here in the middle of the coil without actually touching the coil itself. And I also have it uh, positioned at the opening, but I'll cover why that is in a minute. But generally speaking, this is going to function somewhat like a tuning fork. When the copper is induced to move through some sort of external force, in this case with some sort of shock or vibration, or you know, it could be uh, some other mechanical means of pulling at it or something like that, but when it's released and allowed to freely settle back to this position, it's going to do so in a vibrating motion. And that vibration is going to be sinusoidal. Mathematically deriving that we're going to see damped oscillation in this system is pretty straightforward. It's just like deriving any other uh, spring oscillation system. Um, but I'm not going to go over that here. If that's something that you want to see me do, uh, by all means, let me know down below. But it is worth pointing out that the uh, use of copper here instead of uh, a harder material means that we're going to get a slower um, oscillation here and a longer moment arm means we're also going to see a slower oscillation and I just chose that because you're going to be able to see uh, more results from less vibration that way but if you had a system that you wanted to monitor where the source of uh, the external force that causes the vibration is relatively strong. You might choose a more sturdy material and make the moment arm shorter. And in the case that you actually wanted to make a real seismograph, you could change this whole thing and suspend the magnets from an actual spring or even several springs pointing at different angles, probably orthogonal to one another. Uh, and maybe have them in small tubes, but then have coils run around the outside of the tubes. Uh, when the magnets pass near the opening of the coil, you will see the vibrations and you could actually develop probably a pretty good seismograph that way. But in our case, this is more about seeing the, um, the in this case, inverting amplifier circuit in action and sort of taking advantage of its various niceties. And so this is about as bare bones uh, set up as I can kind of imagine for this sort of thing. And now the circuit that I'm using here is almost identical to the circuit that we went over in um, the AN31 part one that covered sort of op-amp basics and inverting and non-inverting uh, amplifier topologies. Uh, the only changes that I'm making here is the op-amp I'm going with is, uh, it's a, a microchip uh, MCP616. It's a sort of, battery optimized op amp that's meant to run off a single supply, uh, relatively low current. Uh, it, it's sort of a nice all around performer for low power uses. And in this case, I'm sort of trying to limit power usage because I want to power it directly from the, uh, the Arduino. I have here some variation of Arduino. It looks like it's a spark fun redboard, which is just an Arduino Uno with, I guess, couple of niceties. I'm not clear where I picked this one up, but I have it. So I happen to be on my desk. Might as well use it. And you can see that I changed the circuit fairly minimally, but the changes I did make are kind of important uh, and will vary depending on how you would want to use this idea. You can see that instead of a gain of negative 10, like I did with the inverting amplifier in my previous video, this amplifier is going to amplifier signal by uh, a gain of negative 100. Now, obviously I do this because I wanna pick up relatively small vibrations in our system here. And the, the more magnification I get, the more amplification I get, the easier I'm going to be able to see small vibrations. However, this also means that large vibrations are going to clip. They're going to be amplified so much that I'm just going to hit the high supply line, which in this case is going to be five volts uh, pretty quickly. And so what you could do here is set up a system with several of these amplifiers. And in fact, this MCP series, I believe has an IC that is four op amps. You could then have four different setups for four different ranges. You could have say a 10 times gain, a hundred times gain, a thousand times gain, and a 10,000 times gain. And by picking them up by decade that way, you would have something much closer to a real seismograph where reading out of one of the particular amplifiers, one of the gain stages, 
would tell you where you were decade-wise on the scale. And that's pretty much exactly how the Richter scale works. It's a, a decade system. So when you go from, say, an order five to an order six earthquake, that's a jump of one decade. The other major change that you see in this circuit is that instead of grounding our non-inverting input, the non-inverting input here is part of a voltage divider. Uh, and that is so that when we're at rest, we're right in the middle of our supply voltage and our ground supply. So in this case, it's going to float right around 2.5 volts. That gives us a maximum output voltage swing of 2.5 volts peak to peak. And now I find the way that this particular setup works completely fascinating, which is why I chose it as an example. The way this functions is these tiny magnets that I have uh, epoxied onto this copper tubing have a relatively high magnetic density. These are pretty strong little magnets. This coil is going to pick up changes in the magnetic field nearby, and it's going to turn that into a small current. That small current, because of the impedance across this coil, is going to create a small voltage change. That small voltage change is then going to be picked up by our amplifier and amplified, in this case, by negative 100, and then read by our Arduino. There's no problem here going with an inverting gain amplifier because it's going to be a, a symmetric sine wave output, so who cares what positive and negative looks like, at least in this case. And now on the inputs of the op amp, you see that the non-inverting input is not going to move. It's going to stay at exactly the voltage divider voltage throughout this process. It's the inverting pin that's going to see the change in voltage that's induced by the movement of our magnet. And I should say that the reason that I have the magnet positioned so that it's just barely on the inside of the coil, it's just barely penetrating the middle of our coil here. That's because the voltage that we get out of this system is dependent on the change in magnetic flux through this coil. If I just simply put the magnet directly into the coil and then sort of wiggle it around, I'm going to see a lot less change. So putting it right at the opening like this, I'm sort of maximizing the amount of change that I'm going to see in magnetic field. And actually, that's why I picked this as an example. I personally find this kind of setup absolutely fascinating. It gets at the core ideas of what are called Faraday's laws, which I think are amazing. And they relate the sort of interdependence of electrical fields and magnetic fields, where here we use a magnetic field to induce an electrical field. And in fact, you can kind of turn this setup around to do the opposite, which is you can put an electrical field through the coil, you can you know, run a current through the coil, which will then induce a magnetic field around the coil, and you can do all sorts of things, uh, attracting, uh, you know, magnetic metal objects, you know, towards the coil, which is effectively how a speaker works. And that makes this setup sort of effectively a microphone. Okay, I think that's enough of the background on what this is and how it works. So let's take a look at how it performs first uh, on the analog side on the oscilloscope, and then we will take a look at the minimal code that I'm gonna put together for the, uh, the Arduino, and we'll see how you could maybe leverage that in your own ideas. Let's check it out. Here is our circuit all set up and powered and ready to go. The uh, blue channel that you see displayed on the oscilloscope, uh, channel three is our input channel. Now I'm just gonna tap the base and we'll see what the output looks like. And you can see that for soft taps, it looks like we're getting something like maybe 10 to 20 millivolts peak to peak. And for harder taps, we get significantly higher than that, maybe upwards of almost 100 millivolts peak to peak. Here I've turned on channel one with a scale of one volt per division, and that is our output channel. And now you can see that for small vibrations in the base, we get a nice small readable response out of the op amp. And for larger vibrations, we actually end up clipping our output signal. And of course this is fine if we want to be able to detect small vibrations and aren't so worried about very large vibrations. And now let's code our Arduino and take a look at the output on the computer. So here I've fired up a new sketch in Arduino and we're just going to put some minimal code in here in order to get it to print out what it's reading off of the analog input. So first we're going to define a read pin on analog input zero, that's pin A0. 
Then of course we have to set up our serial output so that we can actually read it on our serial monitor and serial plotter. And then we're gonna set the pin mode on that analog pin to input. And in our loop, we're just simply going to keep reading that read pin over and over again. And then what we'll do is we'll just check it out in the serial monitor and the serial plotter. So that should do it. I'm gonna go ahead and save this, upload it to our Arduino and let it run. And you can see here now when I vibrate the base that we get on the serial plotter for the Arduino, uh, representation of what it read off of its ADC. And in this case, when we clip, we see that we get an output that ranges from, you know, 1024 down to zero. And when it's sitting idle, we only get a difference of maybe 20 to 30 in the output that the, the Arduino reads here. And now, like I've been saying all along, of course, you could make this a little bit better and, and suit it more specifically for your purposes, whatever they might be. And then clearly in the Arduino here, once you've read the values, you can do some sort of processing with those values, or you could set up an interrupt to look for... Um, for when the, the values cross a certain threshold and then hook this entire setup onto something. You could find out when a motor is running or when something has started moving and then have your Arduino send you a signal somehow or record the event so that you can check up on it later. All right, that worked great. That was exactly what we were hoping to see. Hopefully you picked up something here that you could use for your own ideas. And if not exactly that, then hopefully you at least found this interesting and are maybe motivated to go out and try something similar yourself. And if you did find this interesting or helpful, please hit the thumbs up down below. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button and the little alerts uh, bell icon to get the alerts for when a new video is released. And yeah, that'll about do it for today. Thanks so much for joining me and I will see you next time.